Good morning. Welcome to St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church in Stittsville for the Sunday morning worship service, March 5th, 2023. And what a beautiful morning it is. Also, welcome to everyone who's joining us on the live stream and those who are going to join us on the recording afterwards. It's great to have you with us. Um, there are a few announcements that were up on the screen. Um, and uh, first of all, a big thank you to everybody who helped out with the, uh, um, the show we had last Saturday night, The Missing Pages, and providing all the goodies for that. And we did raise $645 for, um, uh, for earthquake relief in Turkey and Syria, and also for ongoing relief efforts in Ukraine. So thank you for everyone for helping out with that. And also last week was our annual meeting, and we were back to having a soup and sandwich lunch um, with uh, uh, lots of delicious soups. So thank you to everyone who made those soups and those who got together to make the sandwiches. Um, and also a special thank you to everyone who made the desserts, the goodies that were with the soup and sandwich lunch last week as well. So great to have all of that. Coming up on the 19th of March, in two weeks, uh, will be our uh, Children and Youth Sunday again. Um, so uh, keep that in mind and let other people know as well. And next Sunday, I'm going to be away, and Sally Gad, uh, the retired minister from the Anglican Church, will be the guest preacher next Sunday. So uh, it'll be a, a great opportunity to be here as well. Are there any other announcements that I've missed? Seeing none. Let's take a moment to calm our hearts and still our minds and prepare ourselves for worship. Our opening hymn is Unto the Hills Around Do I Lift Up, number 81 in your hymn books, or you'll see it on the screen. And I invite you to stand if you're able as we join together in singing.
please remain standing, and Lily is going to lead us in the call to worship. Into life's challenges and questions comes the mystery of God. Into our routines and rituals walks the presence of Christ. And God's love brings healing and hope. Into our traditions and conclusions blows the wind of the Spirit. And God's people are born from above. We gather in Jesus' name to encounter God's grace and glory. Let us worship God with open hearts and minds. Please be seated. Let's come before God in prayer. Let us pray. God of light and truth, you draw us here from the busyness of our week, from the many things that occupy our time. We come to offer to you what is due to the Creator from your creation. And we thank you for this time set apart from the everyday. Speak to us, O God, in this time of worship. Make your presence known to us through your word read and spoken and sung. We pray that in hearing your word we might listen, that in listening to your word we might respond, that in responding to your word we might become tangible expressions of your love for this community of Stittsville, for our country, and for the world. We ask this together and pray together with Jesus' words, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Here's the good news of the gospel that is shared with us over and over again. God's love, God's forgiveness, God's care is from everlasting to everlasting. It is a gift given and it is a gift that we share. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Our scripture readings are uh, beginning with Psalm response of Psalm 121. Um, you'll see them up on the screen in a minute, and Catherine is going to lead us. Please join me in the response of Psalm number 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. The Lord will not let your foot be moved. The Lord who keeps you will not slumber. The one who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep you going out and your coming in from this time on and forevermore. Reading from John chapter 3, verses 1 to 21. Now, there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night, and he said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these things that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born from having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? And Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who is descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent into the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the, on of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and people loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that they may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's come before God in prayer. Let us pray. Lord God, still in us the busyness of this week, the concerns of this day. Speak to us in ways we can understand, help us to learn and to grow and to be changed by you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as I was preparing the service for this week, I was the sermon, I was thinking about the whole service as well. 
and I was thinking about having communion too, and I started thinking about the time. Got to try and get the service done in under an hour if I possibly can. And I, I think I'm probably one of the few people who actually worries much about that. Um, I don't, I've never had anyone come to me after the service and say, that was way too long, don't do that again. <laughs> but it still sits in my mind. I still worry about it and wonder about it. And I'm keenly aware that the passage this morning includes John 3.16 probably one of the most familiar passages in the Bible. A lot of people don't actually read it, they just put it on a piece of paper and hold it up at sports events, but it's an important passage for many people. And that really, that passage must be what Jesus is getting at. That must be the whole kernel of this passage. It must be the focal point where Jesus is heading towards. In fact, Martin Luther, the 16th century reformer, said that John, John 3.16 is the entire gospel of Jesus Christ in one verse. But one of the problems we have in trying to understand the Bible, I think, is that we too often have a favorite or familiar passage. And we miss the main point of it because we miss the context. We miss what's happening around it. John 3.16 is a foundational passage, but what does John 3.17 say. What's the context of these familiar words? John 3.16 doesn't exist in a vacuum. When Dicodemus came to Jesus seeking wisdom, trying to learn about God, trying to learn about Jesus and what Jesus was doing, Jesus didn't just jump into, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's not what Jesus did. He began by having a conversation with Nicodemus. And the gospel writer has passed on that whole story to us as more than just a kernel of wisdom, more than just a short soundbite distilled for our quick consumption. We have to hear the story about Nicodemus to really understand what's going on. And so who was this Nicodemus? Why was he coming to Jesus in the first place? Well, Nicodemus was an impor important uh, part of the religious establishment. He was a Pharisee, most likely part of the Jewish council, the Sanhedrin. He was about as righteous in the eyes of the Jewish law as a person could be. And as the story goes, as we hear it through the Gospel of John, Nicodemus came to Jesus in the dark of night to ask him some questions. We're not told exactly why he came. We don't know if he was intrigued by what Jesus was teaching or if he was concerned with what Jesus was teaching. What we do know is that Nicodemus came to him, and by coming to him, he was doing something that was quite dangerous. If anyone were to see Nicodemus speaking with Jesus, he could lose his position on the Jewish council. He could certainly be accused of secretly being a follower of this Jesus, who was being seen as quite a radical. That's why he comes to Jesus by night. He didn't want anyone to see what he was doing. He didn't want to risk losing his religious prestige by being seen associated with a teacher who was known to talk with and spend time with prostitutes, tax collectors, drunkards. There's another reason, though, why this passage takes place in the dark of night in John's Gospel. Dark darkness is often used in the scriptures, and especially in John's Gospel, as a metaphor for, for ignorance, or even beyond that, an unwillingness to believe. Jesus, as we'll hear later in the Gospel of John, is the light of the world. So when Nicodemus comes to Jesus in the dark with his question, we see two things. He is, in a sense, kind of stumbling in the darkness. But in his stumbling, he's also moving from the darkness towards the light that is Jesus. That's all happening on a whole other level in this passage. Nicodemus is scared, but he's looking for something more than what he has in his life already. And he's looking for some sort of new beginning. So back to the story, Jesus was alone in the night. Nicodemus emerges from the shadows. He comes looking for answers. But their conversation doesn't really go all that well if you listen to what was said. Jesus is speaking of spiritual things kind of up here, and Nicodemus is misunderstanding Jesus' words, kind of functioning on a very practical, pragmatic level. Jesus talks about being born of water and spirit, about being born again or born from above. And Nicodemus is so rooted in the physical world that he couldn't see what Jesus was trying to say. Can a person enter the mother's womb and be born a second time? Nicodemus asked. 
How can that be? And even though Nicodemus is a wise scholar, he could not see that Jesus was actually talking about making a fresh start, having a new beginning. When Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again or born from above, Nicodemus missed the subtle second meaning of what Jesus was saying. We don't all speak Greek, but apparently the Greek word that's used here is more in the sense of a fresh start. It can be meaning born again, but it also means born from above. That's why our text we have says uh, born from above instead of born again. And if you read other translations of this passage, it'll say you must be born again. But born from above implies born of God, born of the Spirit, a spiritual birth. Jesus was telling Nicodemus he needed a fresh start, a new spiritual birth from God from above if he was to understand what God's kingdom is all about. But that's not clear for Nicodemus. It's not black and white enough for Nicodemus. After all, Nicodemus is a man of learning. He's a teacher of the law. And what Jesus was talking about was, was something new. This new beginning wasn't as concrete, it wasn't as tangible as the law that they had. Jesus was talking about spirit. The spirit, God's spirit, wind, breath, like a breath of fresh air. Unpredictable because it blows wherever it wills as well. It's not as easy to understand, this spirit. It's not as easy to interpret. It's not as easy to control as law. This is difficult for Nicodemus to get his head around. It's difficult for Nicodemus to accept. Nicodemus could understand the specific rules, the regulations that people must follow. And without those clear rules, without those laws, how could they be God's people? How could they be certain if they threw those away, if they followed the spirit like Jesus was saying? An unpredictable spirit like the wind blowing wherever it wants. And did they have to throw away the laws to do that? Finally, Jesus says to Nicodemus, it's not really about the laws, it's about love. I'm paraphrasing. It's about God's overwhelming love for this world that God created. God's love for this mixed up and often messed up world that we live in. And for our lives that we too often try to live on our own without God. It's about love, Jesus was saying. You cannot even begin to imagine how much God loves us. And God loves this world. And it's at this point in the conversation that finally Jesus shares those words with Nicodemus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. So that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He keeps going. Indeed, God did not send the son into this world to condemn the world, to judge the world. But in 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 order that the world might be saved through him. God loves this world. And there we have it. The kernel of meaning, the soundbite in the story, the climax of the encounter between Jesus and Nicodemus, and also the climax of the story of God's relationship with this world. God loves us that much. And yet even in the darkness of the night, that light does not always go on all at once. Nicodemus didn't see it all at that moment, like letting a campfire on a dark night One match, one bit of paper, a few twigs. The spark comes and it becomes a small light and you think it's catching and then it grows dim and it becomes only an ember. Then someone has to blow on it and the ember glows and the paper catches and the twigs begin to crackle and soon there is a roaring fire for people to gather around. The light sometimes comes gradually. Sometimes it goes away and comes back again. Nicodemus, the great scholar, the pillar of the religious community, could not yet see the light. The spark had been lit. It had started to burn, but the light had not entirely caught. As Jesus continued speaking about darkness and about light, as Jesus continued speaking about what he was doing in this world, and how some people prefer to stay in the darkness, Nicodemus begins to recede into the shadows, back into the night. Jesus continues talking in this passage and we don't hear from Nicodemus again and we can picture him just slipping away back into the shadows. For a time he'd come out of the darkness, into the light that was Jesus' presence. But that light had meant too much risk. It had meant too much change. 
As Nicodemus disappeared further and further back into the darkness, Jesus' world, words trailed off. Nicodemus was out of sight. He seems to be swallowed up by the night, by the darkness. I know I can see more than a little of myself in Nicodemus sometimes, and maybe you can too. We don't always understand Jesus' words, what Jesus is trying to say to us, but we're drawn to him, sometimes even stumbling in the darkness, but still bringing questions and bringing our misunderstandings and still coming to him week after week. We know that somehow he is the light of the world that often seems so dark, but it also seems as though as if we, are, we cannot fully understand what Jesus is asking of us. And if we did understand it, it might be too much for us to handle. It's safer. It's easier just to kind of recede back into the darkness. But the embers keep glowing. And we know that at the heart of what Jesus is teaching us is that incredible gift of God's love. God loves us in our world more than we can imagine. God loves us so much that he's willing to come to us himself in the person of Jesus, his own child, a love that can cast out fear. If we do see ourselves in the person of Nicodemus, then there's some good news in the story as well. Nicodemus' story is not over when he recedes into the darkness. He came to Jesus first in the darkness, but he came back again as well. In the darkness of those shadows that night, the light of Jesus' presence seemed like it was too much for him to bear. So he slipped back into the shadows. But that spark that was lit became a fire. Nicodemus came back to Jesus a second time. The second time, it was not covered in the darkness of night, but in broad daylight for all to see. The second time, Nicodemus came in humility and brokenness, bringing spices and linens to bury his crucified Lord in the Garden of Gethsemane. The self-righteousness was gone. The shadows and the darkness are gone. The fear, the trepidation were gone. And in the light of Jesus' presence, Nicodemus chose to serve Jesus as a last act of humility, preparing his body for burial. Nicodemus did find his new beginning. He stepped out into the light and admitted that Jesus' life and teaching were important to him. As he embraced that idea that God's love is so much more more than a set of rules that we can follow. That God's love for us compels us to love each other and to help all those who are around us. As I was thinking about this and I was visiting at, at Banting this last week, I had an incredible conversation with one of the teachers over at Banting. She used to be a Christian and her father was a minister as well or had been a minister. He had left being a minister in the church and she had given up on religion and has nothing more to do with religion. She asked me how I could continue to be part of a church with all the bad things that are done in the name of religion and especially all the things the Christian church has done through colonialism and the treatment of indigenous people in Canada and around the world. I admitted that she had a really good question and I admitted too that it's difficult sometimes but at the heart of what Jesus is teaching is love. God's love for us that we are called to share with everyone. And that Jesus and the church have also taught me that we make mistakes. And sometimes we make huge mistakes. And it's our job to continually look at what we do and what we say. And if it's not rooted in God's love for us and God's love for others, then we're on the wrong track. And the church has also taught me that we need to own our own mistakes, admit our mistakes, apologize for our mistakes, and work at reconciliation making things right with those we've hurt. And to me, that's a much better path than trying to convince ourselves that it's someone else who is to blame and that they need to solve the problem of the world. Love, respect, dignity, equity are the framework on which everything else we do is built. If it is not, when it is not, then we're on the wrong path. Then we need a new beginning. We need a new path, and we need to be led back into the light. Thanks be to God that we can do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray.
We thank you, O oh God, that you're always near to us. Do you draw us close to you? You are a light that shines in the darkness. You work in us and through us. You correct us and you guide us. And for those things, we give you thanks. May we continually seek your light, O oh God, day after day, week after week, year after year. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We have been richly blessed in this life. One of the ways we give thanks is with our tithes and our offerings. The offering plate will now be brought forward. And Christy, are you willing to do that? Lord God, we do thank you for your gifts and goodness in our lives and in this world. We ask that what we've shared today might be a token and pledge of who we are and what we have. Help us to bring light wherever there is darkness in the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. We are in the season of Lent now, a season of repentance, a season of introspection, a season of simplicity. We also remember that we gather together with those who are at home, those who are online, those who are not physically here, and that our church is bigger than these walls. This is the Lord's table. Come not, not because you're strong, but because you're weak. Come not because any goodness of your own gives you a right to be here, but come because God loves you. And God wants you to be here at this table. Come because God gave himself for you. Let's taste and see that God is good. Let's do something we haven't done in three years. Let's take a moment to share the peace of Christ with each other. I don't encourage you to shake hands, but I do encourage you to stand and share the peace of Christ. And you say, may the peace of Christ be with you. And you respond, and also with you. May the peace of Christ be with you. I'm also going to do something that I did a year ago as well, right after the uh, invasion of Ukraine by the Russian army. And we, uh, we grew up using a Ukrainian grace. My brother-in-law taught us this. And it's a simple grace that simply means um, for the gifts on the table, we give you thanks. And so I'm going to use that Ukrainian grace right now, and then we'll go into singing our communion hymn. Now I'm going to repeat, ask you to repeat after me. Um, it, it is a repeat after me grace. So uh, in Ukrainian, we're going to say, for the gifts on the table, we give you thanks, oh God. Repeat after me. Bože. Bože. Jakuju. Tobis. Zatsidara. Nastoli. Amin. Let's join together in singing the first three verses of Put Peace into Each Other's Hands. Number 560, and you'll also see it on the screen.
We'll join together in the great prayer of thanksgiving and you'll see the responses on the screen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right that we should praise you, gracious God. You created all things. You formed us in your own image. In the great diversity that is your creation, you also created us. When we turned away from you in sin, you didn't stop caring about us, but opened a path of salvation, not just for us, but for all people. You made a covenant, a promise with Israel. And through your servants, Abram and Sarah, you gave that promise that they would be a blessing to all nations. Through Moses, you led your people from bondage to freedom. Through the prophets, you renewed your promise of salvation. Therefore, with them and with all your saints who have served you in every age, we join with the whole creation to lift our hearts in joyful praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy God, source of life and goodness, all creation rightly gives you praise. In the fullness of time, you sent your own son to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. Jesus healed those who were sick. He ate and drank with people who were considered outcasts and sinners in his own time. He opened the eyes of those who were blind and proclaimed the good news of your kingdom to all who were poor and in need. In all things, Jesus fulfilled your gracious will. Now, O oh God, Jesus' sacrifice has destroyed the power of sin and death. By raising him to life, you've given us life forevermore as well. You call your people to be baptized, to renew their covenant with you, to be fed at this table, the table of your son, until we feast with you and all those who've gone before us at the joyful victory feast of the people of God. As we share this bread and this cup, help us to remember all those who've been examples to us in the faith. Help us to remember and give thanks for those who've influenced our lives in so many ways, those who are still among us, those who have died and already share in the joy of your presence. We gather together with all those who have gone before us when we gather at this table, and we remember them. Lord God, we give you thanks. We return to you in faith. Therefore, we join together as your people as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Recalling his death, proclaiming his resurrection, looking for his coming again in glory, we lift to you, O God, this bread and this cup. Send your Holy Spirit upon us and these gifts, that all who eat and drink at this table may be one body and one holy people, a living sacrifice in Jesus Christ our Lord. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory is yours, God most holy, now and forevermore. Amen. As we gather at this table, we gather here and we gather with those who are at home online as well. I received from the Lord that, that which I also hand on to you. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant, the new relationship between you and God, and it's sealed in my blood. Whenever you drink it, remember me. Therefore, every time we eat this bread, every time we share this cup, we remember Jesus' life and death and resurrection until he comes again. Truly, these are the gifts of God for the people of God, and we give thanks to God. I invite you to taste and see that God is good. As usual, I invite you to come down the center aisle to uh, take a cup which will have uh, juice and uh, bread in it. The lighter juice is apple juice, if you have a grape intolerance. And in the center, there is also uh, some gluten-free options with both grape juice and apple juice. Um, so uh, I invite you to come forward, as we are the diverse people of God, and we celebrate that together as God's people. Taste and see that God is good.
This is the bread of life broken for you. Taste and see that God is good. is the cup of salvation, the cup of the new relationship between you and God. Taste and see that God is good. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have chosen to give yourself to us. May we live by that example, O oh God. As we go into the world that surrounds us, as we see situations, as we see needs that arise, help us to be ready to give ourselves for others as well. We live in a world of need, O oh God, and we live in a beautiful world. We give you thanks, and we ask that we might be light in that world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. bring these things to God in prayer. Let us pray. We do thank you, O God, that we can gather together as your people. We can see the needs that exist around us and around the world and realize that we only see a small portion of them. You are keenly aware of all the needs that exist, and yet you still encourage us to come together, to share our concerns with each other, and to bring our prayers to you. We know that you always hear you always listen. For that, we give you thanks. We pray for those who are close to us and those who are world away who we've never met. We also see the impacts of things around the world in our own neighborhoods, in our own space. We pray for migrants, for asylum seekers, for those who don't feel safe where they live and need another place to be. We pray for creative solutions, for all levels of government, and also for us as well. Help us to see the need exi that exists and try to imagine what it would be like if we were in their situation. We pray as well for peace in Ukraine. We pray for political leaders the world over to bring peace, to stop the insanity of what's going on. Pray that you watch over all the people who have been affected by this in Ukraine and the innocent people in Russia as well. As we pray for peace, we also think of what's going on in Turkey and Syria with earthquake and response to that and ways that we can be helpful there, but also the political regimes that sometimes don't help when it comes time to bringing, bringing what needs to happen. And so we pray for them. We pray as well for the people of Iran and especially the women in Iran and what they're facing, and in Afghanistan as well. And we pray for, uh, for peace in our world and for dignity for all your children. We also know, oh God, there are some prayers that are deep inside us and that we don't have the words that can express them. And so when we don't have words, we come to you in silence. In silence we pray, in silence we listen. Hear our prayers, oh God.
Let's come together in the second half of our hymn, uh, put peace into each other's hands, verses four and five. And you'll see it up on the screen or it's number 560. giving thanks to God for his presence with us. We go from this place into the world that surrounds us, often seeing darkness around us, but knowing that there is light. May we find that light. May we seek that light. May we be changed by that light. And may we change the world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Now may the Christ who walks on wounded feet walk with you on the road. May the Christ who serves with wounded hands stretch out your hands to serve. May the Christ who loves with a wounded heart open your hearts to love. May you see the face of Christ in everyone you meet, and may everyone you meet see the face of Christ in you. Go now in peace. I will do it in two parts. You want to check the bells first? <laughs> Go now in peace. Go now in peace. First time in three years, we're going to have coffee hour. So please stay and enjoy coffee hour, and uh, may God go with you. <laughs> 